the, the point that I want to make to you is very simple, that we have a problem with pain. Yeah, that's a truism. The other point that I want to make to you is that all of you sort of looking at me and going, well, this guy doesn't have an English accent. How come he's at Oxford? I also want to apologize. It's not a speech impediment. It's a New York accent. So I'll, I'll try to speak English as best I can. And I may also slip into some jargon, which is really more neuroethical jargon. If I do, stop me. But it's going to be a bit like drinking out of the fire hose because what I want to try to do for about the next 40 minutes or so is set the tone for you what I would think would be very, very important take-home messages over each and every one of the talks that you're about to hear. Science is poised, really, at the cutting edge of things we can do and perhaps some things we really can't do. So the critical question is really if we're going to move forward, which is the advocacy piece, which is not just mere esoteric rhetoric. If we're really going to move forward, how do we translate research and technology into practice? How do we go from books to bench, to bedside, and then back to boardroom to make it happen. Now, this then gives us the, the issue, the, the problem we have of pain. And the problem we have of pain is really intrinsic and inextricable from its definition. You're all workingly familiar, I'm sure, with the IASP definition. I need not bore you by reading the slide. But what's important to understand in this definition is that it's axiomatic that pain is, in fact, both a physiological event of the peripheral and central nervous system, sometimes serially, sometimes hierarchically, very often concomitantly. But the mere fact that we call it pain, pain qua pain, as pain, that we know it, the noxiousness of pain is by its nature a phenomenological and psychological experience of the one who has some form of activity somewhere in the neurological axis. So we understand that certainly it's based upon some function of the peripheral and central nervous system that engages the brain in its function, this thing that we struggle with trying to get our head around, pun intended, what mind is all about. But we also understand that both brain and mind and the nervous system, as you'll hear over the course of the next several days of lecture, are plastic, malleable, individually variant. We have an adage in neuroscience that I'm sure you're well aware of, see one brain, see one brain. Moreover, that may incur C1 pain, C1 pain. The groundswell of movement towards this idea of personalized medicine certainly embraces that as its mantra. But then how do we, in fact, do this? How do we face the mantra of pain and the brain move ahead and not fumble this thing that we hold in our hands? How do we begin to unravel some of the mysteries there and do so in a way that has a strong translational focus. How do we do this? Well, part of this really exemplifies the problem of pain. In many ways, the problem of pain confronts head-on the ambiguities of this mind-body problem. What represents a psychological event? What represents a physiological event? Throw it away. Such artificial dualisms of Cartesian nature, I think, really bear no relevance to what we're doing here. It, it is the embodied brain-mind that is embedded in the socio-culture of time and place that is that person. In many ways, this then confronts what is sometimes referred to as the hard problems of neuroscience. This gives Peter Moskowitz agita when I say this. But it does, because there are still plenty of individuals who try to struggle with, well, if we really don't have a good handle on the way the brain makes mind, how can we struggle with it? You can. It's easy. You sidestep that issue, and you leave that to a particular research agenda that learns much from pain research that can ground it back to other pressing issues of neuroscience. There is a reciprocity here. They are not necessarily wholly interdependent. But in confronting those things, what we really ground this down to is the default question of what is? What is the brain mind? What is pain? Is it, is it in fact, wholly reducible to some type of physiological event of the central and peripheral nervous system? And if so, then that should be objectifiable, no? Or is it something more? And are we sort of leaning towards being some kind of closet Cartesianist and say, well, no, it's really more than that. The author Raymond Tallis in his newest book, The Aping of Mankind, talks about the, the social nature of consciousness. And Professor Tallis goes a bit far. I respect much of what he says. Certainly consciousness is indeed a brain event. But it's also exteroceptive as much as it's interoceptive. And the embeddedness of that person means that we really have to get into some of these questions, not on a philosophical ground, but because we're compelled ethically to address the fact that pain doesn't just happen out there. It happens in the person who is the patient, from the Latin patior, the one who suffers. And that person has an embodied nervous system and is embedded in the socio-culture, inclusive of the milieu of medicine. Well, 
any approach to that person then by virtue of an ethical embrace of, of how we use knowledge, not for its own sake, but for flourishing human good to reduce the burden of the human predicament, has to be current. Otherwise, it's at very, very least anachronistic, at very worst dogmatic, non-current, something other than science, which does no one any good. What do we know? We know there are certainly many variables that affect pain. You'll hear many of them. I'm, I'm not going to take this into a very, very deep dive because that would, in fact, just be superfluous. Over the next couple of days, you'll hear people who are far smarter than me talking about many of these issues. We know there are genetic predispositions, molecular basis of various channels, membrane domains, various receptors, whole areas of the neuraxis, individual variation in the anatomical structure of regions of the brain, spinal cord, and periphery. We know that these then do, in fact, predispose individually variant activities that are based upon macro and micro structure, without a doubt. But we also recognize that there is an interaction here with environmental effects. From the conceptus all the way to the grave. What we've learned, if nothing, from neuroscience over the past several years, as Professor Cooper will tell you, being a developmental biologist, is that the ongoing interaction is, in fact, longitudinal. Certainly, there are open windows of critical periodicity. But the windows stay open at varying levels throughout the lifespan, and the profundity of a number of experiences, physical and psychological, to determine how wide those windows are open and what comes in and out, and pain is one of those things. Moreover, we understand that there are profound social effects. Here we see pain being part of culture, but I want you to think of culture a little differently. Think of culture the way a biologist thinks of culture, the way I, who worked in cell culture for a long time, think of culture. It's certainly a medium that gives rise to a bunch of things, genotypes, phenotypes. Culture does that, geographically, socially, over time. But it's also a forum for their expression that provides particular attractors and constraints, the way experiences are tolerated, the way expressions are allowed, condoned, sanctioned, condemned. It's not just nature or nurture, it's both. Take a moment to look at the slide. This is the dynamic we see of a complex system embedded within systems. Even from the level of the initial formulation of the genotype, it's environmentally dependent. Show of hands, in this room, how many people had both a mother and a father? See? It works. We know they had to come together, sometimes by accident, sometimes by not. My dad said he should have named me Oops. We'll leave that for another conversation. But even so, in the environments of how they got together, sometimes it's environmental because of locale. Sometimes there are other stronger factors. But even so, that initial environment that established that genotype was important to determine which particular genes may be turned on and which may be not. We've learned much about developmental neurobiology, where I got my start in terms of what's going on in utero in determining the plasticity and developmental predispositions of that nervous system throughout the lifespan. We confront that when dealing with the pediatric patient, the, the quagmire of to treat or not to treat, whether it's better to incur the burdens and, and arrows of a longitudinality of chronic pain or perhaps predispose the system towards various tolerances and sensitivities as a consequence of exposure to pharmacology. But either way, when we get down to the fact of the entirety of the organism, we see it's not just structure or function, genes or environment, phenotype or environment, it's the whole gamish. And then this obviously is expressing itself via somatic state, various sensations, perceptions, cognitions, behaviors, and these then feed back the arrows of biopsychosocial or bidirectional at each and every one of those tiers. There is not mutual exclusivity in this paradigm, which then brings us to the point that many of these disorders, if not, if I should be so bold, all of these disorders of neuropsychiatric nature, pain inclusive, are characteristically expressed as a spectrum, a spectrum of effects that incurs a variety of manifest characteristics based upon genotype, environment, and phenotype via expression. We determine the decisional threshold of what's pathologic or not. We were discussing last night over a very, very entertaining meal, and I remember most of it through the haze of wonderful things that we had to drink, that the idea of where we set that threshold depends on a number of things. It's not necessarily a question of what the norm may be. Norms can be decided biologically, socially, psychologically. It's very often where we set the ideal a wonderful, wonderful idea. And I give you full credit for it. <laughs> he didn't say a word. It was all my idea. It is a decisional threshold. It's a practical kind. And, and we're reliant, at least in part, upon certain natural kinds of distinctions. And that's where the neuroscience is so important. 
because it helps to understand when the system becomes aberrantly linear, how we then move to an increasing trend of pathologicity and what then such pathologicity incurs for deviations of the ideal that are not only phenomenological to the patient, but represent an objective criteria for the clinician. And this then brings us headlong into the problem of pain in the clinical encounter. It's objectifying the subjective. We confront here many of the same problems we have with consciousness. Ladies and gentlemen, the, the characteristics of consciousness are threefold. It's subjective, it's intentional, it's transparent only to self. The same is true for pain. Oh, you may say, no, I, I know behaviors, I know antalgic postures and compensation behaviors. You're exactly right. Look at me, do you have any idea if I'm in pain or not? Do you? No. I wish we could do this little Star Trek thing that goes woo, woo, boom, and we can see, and, and perhaps that's the wonder of these various forms of neuroimaging taken together and not alone or apart from other areas of not only neurotechnology, but other forms of clinical competencies that in fact rely upon physical examination, a variety of tests, and some very profound level of intersubjectivity. Ultimately, we're always dependent in medicine upon the Sydenhamian method, the nosological method, the characterization of fitting particular characteristics to a disease state and then matching that back to a patient. But these are very much affected by the technological turn. The question is not whether or not technology is viable. It's a question of what we're going to do with it. And this has really been explosive over the past, though, I would say 20, 30 years. When I get into neuroscience, I look around the room, there are many people who are about my age or a little older. Uh, neuroscience was not even a titular field until the middle of the 1970s, as you recall. And then suddenly this explosive growth from the 70s, concatenated by the Human Genome Project that added much to the molecular validity of neuroscientific toolkits, the decade of the brain, which depending on who you talk to, did certain good things and failed in other ways. But it's certainly instantiated, I think, a think tank atmosphere, not only in the States, but internationally, that is still carrying through somewhat today. The contentious, if not provocative, decade of pain control and research, which I think it's still a bit too premature to determine what the actual outcomes of that are going to be for clinical translation. That takes about a five to 10 year flow of, of, of iteration. The National Neurotechnology Initiative, something that we've been very, very proud and working with. Certainly, Vince Clark was a part of that as well. We're now trying to revivify that for the next coming election year under this large big science agenda proposed by the Obama administration to be the zeitgeist for the forthcoming term, optimistically hoping for re-election. But the idea that, that big science can be nested certainly predicts what are going to be the avenues and silos into which we can then put big, big science, these large agendas, such as the Human Genome Project, the Manhattan Project, the Space Project. Well, and strict transparency, I can tell you that about 80% of my work is funded by the Department of the Navy. The opinions that I'm giving you here are not reflective in whole the Department of the Navy, Bureau of Medicine and Surgery. However, they're strongly, very much part of the incentive to address big science, not only towards things that are national security, defense and intelligence, but national security is also a question of public health. Come on, everybody in this room knows you can't swing a wet cat over your head not the animal a rope, a red cat over your head without hitting the problem of pain as a profound public health problem that impacts our security. How then do we align these agendas with the contemporary health care plan that's going to be articulated from 2013 to 2015 to engage big science and large technologies in those ways that are not only technically right but morally good so as to affect the populace? How do we do that? Well, one of the things we're seeing is a large level of convergence in neuroscience. Neuroscience no longer works within sort of the narrow confines of its boundaries. We see genetics, nanoscience, and technology. As you'll hear from my colleague, Dr. Mariko Sinski, you'll see cyber science and technology that I'll talk to you a little bit about that make much of these neuroimaging technologies not only valid, but valuable. And much of this is being drawn into assessment of the very strong predicament and problem of pain, trying to bridge, or at least in some cases, identify those gaps between subjectivity and objectivity. What we have here is great potential. What I hope that you'll hear over the course of the next few days is the nature of this potential, but also an elucidation of those areas that are problematic, not simply to fetch about the dark, but to light a candle for the forthcoming research agenda, because that's gonna be important. Neuroscience and these fields have utilized wonderful, not only tools to theory heuristics, what do we know about the brain, mind, and pain based upon those tools that we have at hand, but how then can those new and very contemporary theorizations be substantiated and then used 
as the basis for additional tools that help us to translate the research effort into clinical practice. Recognizing and confronting the mechanistic paradox. We can't know everything. What is necessary to know, what is sufficient to know so we can then navigate what to do, what not to do, and what we should do in those situations. Well, indeed, what we find is we're moving ever more into this model, out of the old silos of discipline A, discipline B, discipline C, that engage a variety of information that's, quote, out there, and then feed that information, but do so within sort of rather narrow confines of blinders, maintaining their parochiality. Certainly, we're seeing far more of this. Now, I'm not saying this is impossible. But it's difficult, and part of the reason is that the administrative infrastructures of large universities don't handle this as well. That kind of interdisciplinarity is, is sometimes difficult to create metrics for. But we're making some good progress. A recent paper that appeared in the journal Science speaks to the idea of convergence as a real paradigm. Some of the work I'm doing with a colleague of mine, Ashok Vashasta and Kerry Balaban, and the work that we're doing here at University of New Mexico with, with the IGER program, seeks to do just this kind of thing crack open those older parochial silos and recognize an increased opportunistic space for the exchange of information, tools, techniques, but also reappropriation of problem spaces. And it's much of that desiloing that led to these neurotechnologies that we now embrace as the focus of this conference, and I would imagine as the marching orders for the pain field over the next five to 10 years. Sharpening the point of these spheres of assessment are going to be very helpful to recognize what can we objectify, what can we not? And then how do we embrace what Stan Reiser says, that real medicine begins where our technology may leave off? And I like that quote. I'm not going to bore you with these images. You know what they are. The question here is, can we image pain? And I think in many ways we can, at least within a particular set of limits. But what does it mean when we get an image of pain? What does that actually mean? Moreover, further aspects of neuroscience and technology are neurodiagnostic, the use of infrared you'll hear also throughout the course of these lectures, computational neuropsychiatric modeling that I think is very important, various neurometrics and biomarkers, neurogenetics, proteomics, the idea of predicting pain. Who may in fact come down with these pain syndromes? What is going to be their trajectories? Once again, very important to determine predisposition so as to keep individuals out of harm's way. And then each one of these assessed substrates and mechanisms become very, very viable targets for intervention. If I can see it, I can engage it. If I have an idea how it works, I can intervene at that level on a mechanistic way and in that particular orientation try to at least mitigate pain. And we're seeing this. The development of novel neuropharmacologics, including things like novel analgesics and various neurotropics, and the use of nanopharmaceutics to get higher biopharmaceutical delivery and site-specific action without the larger shotgun approach. You'll hear some of that. Moreover, the use of indwelling devices is becoming ever more common as we're beginning to move away from some of those older limitations of the clunkier devices and moving ever more towards refining some of the micro and nano stimulators and mitigating devices that we can now utilize not only indwelling devices, but an indwelling probe that is then externally controlled or utilizing very, very small power and or delivery sources so as to maximize utility of function. Moreover, tissue transplants, genografts, ever more common, ever more popular, and not in the least because we understand more about the nature of the substrate of the parenchyma, the idea of the neural satellite and stem cell, and what these things do in vivo, and how these may be harnessed through the use of various genetic and molecular probes to then turn on and change the existing phenotypes away from those more nociceptive or allodynic phenotypes towards something that's far more normative with regard to the brain and spinal cord's capacity to modulate pain. You know that many of these advances in neuroscience have, in fact, been technologically enabled. I don't have to go through the short list. We're here. That's what we're going to talk about. Neuroimaging, neurogenomics, genetics, neuroproteomics. Moreover, the very reason we're here is to probe and understand their translational viability, and many of them are. The idea of these types of correlations of anatomical and physiologic variables, populational variation, individual trajectories, these are each one of the translational avenues that both singularly and in concert, I think, hold great promise for the future. Are there issues? Are there issues that then impact the ethical value of some of this information, this technology? For sure. What are they? Mainly the things you see here. As any one of the individuals who does neuroimaging will tell you, is it's going to have real validity with an individual. I have to be able to chart against that individual's working baseline. And then if I wanted to provide some normative standards, perhaps against a larger population. Impossible? Not at all. 
We know what we can do is we can get individual cohort and populational data tiers. This allows very rapid and real-time access requirements so as to really maximize and optimize what neuroimaging and other forms of assessment technologies can do across large databases, where we're able to say these are the particular clades that make this particular type of individual similar to this type of individual. It's a networked approach that looks at the systems rather than just looking at the disease, and then clusters those individuals together to say this is what they have in common, this is what they don't. This is the way it works. This is a model that we've worked out for neurocyber integration, looking at multiple tiers of data within a large data matrix. I don't have time to get into the details and drill down, but one of the things that should pop out for you about this is that it has to be intrinsically biopsychosocial. See? Biopsychosocial. It cannot ignore that element because that element is critical in the expression of many of these phenotypes and how those phenotypes then may manifest those characteristics that are going to be clinically relevant. Those data are just as important as what's happening by a three by three millimeter voxel size somewhere in the pulvinar of the thalamus. Because that thalamus sits in the brain of somebody who's got a body who sits somewhere in an environment who's a person. So the plan here is to match these types of data across the lifespan. Doable? Certainly doable. Requiring a neurocyber fusion? Without a doubt. Problematic in some regards with regard to the hackability of those things that are stacked at these data points. Yeah, it's a huge issue and one that is going to be, I think, a major problem for not only HIPAA, but for larger security issues. Again, a conversation we're happy to have with you offline. Not only is this important for individual data, so as to be able to say, how do we treat an N of one, a patient, to compare themselves to where they were previously and what various trajectories may then be plottable through a use of neurotechnology and these modeling stratagems, we can also use this as group analytic data to take those types of individuals' data across the lifespan comparatively to cohorts who may manifest similar genome phenotypes and other forms of expressive characteristics and then do that within larger populations to get a better picture of this thing we call pain as a pan-human condition. And that creates some normative inference that may then change the level of idealization what are our therapeutic targets? What are we striving for? What represents diversity? What represents norm? Look, indeed, neuroscience has made huge leaps. I'm proud to be a neuroscientist. But we haven't gotten everything. It's allowed some understandings of the formal workings, but we still haven't gotten down to the efficient causality. And this is where I want you to be cautious a bit. In my last 15 minutes or so, what I want to talk to you about is the ethical issues that arise from this very, very strong and I think vibrant and important pendulum swing of science and technological progress. Beware neuro nonsense. I wish I coined that term. It's my colleague Roger Scruton from Oxford, and he says it's so much better than I do. Jim, it's all neuro nonsense. You know, Roger, you're, you're right in a lot of ways. I'll take great credit for this term, though neurolalia, neurobabble. Go to the store, literally. When you're done here this afternoon, go to a, a, a store, go, look around at a newspaper, a magazine, guarantee you see neuro prefix with something, neuromarketing, neuroeconomics, neurotheology, neuro law. There's actually a neuro cola. I'm not slamming the product. Works on your brain to make you feel good. Everything works on your brain to make you feel good. The cola is no different. The idea here is that this is sexy, it's attractive, but your job, is to parse through the fluff and get to the real. Images are highly attractive. What do they really tell us? The neuro prefix is not some type of certainty towards an ultimate reductive materialism. No, no. What it suggests strongly is that there is a material substrate, and that material substrate manifests itself psychosocially, and that the real problems of what represent disease and then manifest illness are an engagement of that process dynamically. This is part of the work of this field that I play 60% or more of my time with these days, neuroethics. Uh, initially an incipient field in the late 18, 1980s and then early 1990s really caught fire in the United States. 2002, Dana Conference, Bill Sapphire, the late New York Times uh, columnist, uses the term at a Dana Conference. It's like throwing a match in a dry brush in California middle of summer, but a boom. Now neuroethics is on the lips of everybody, not just the academics and the intelligentsia. It's out there in the public. But let me tell you what neuroethics really is. There's two traditions here. One is the study of the neural basis of morality and ethics, neuromorality. Very important study because pain figures very strongly 
in the ecological interactions the way humans behave. And I think that there's a, a big area here that also interfaces with pain studies, and we do some of that. The other is a little more germane to this conversation. So it's ethical issues that arise in and from the use of neuroscience and neurotechnologies in medicine, public life, national defense, and certainly part of medicine and public life that we're dealing with here is pain care. What are the neuroethical issues that are relevant to research and diagnosis in pain medicine? Well, certainly one of the things we confront right off is the technological imperative, as coined by the philosopher Hans Lenk. If we build it, use it. It's sort of the scientific and technological issue of the field of dreams phenomenon. If I build it, they will come. If I build it, we must use it. And if we use it, use it a lot. Drives the price down. Even though we may not necessarily know what's going on there. This then allows us to confront the limits of technology. What are we really doing? We have to avoid what's sometimes referred to as picture thinking here. Earlier this morning, we heard a wonderful conversation about eyewitness. We have to be careful. Is the eyewitness the neuro image? Or is the eyewitness the pain patient? These images are sexy, attractive, and I love them. I was trained to do some of this stuff. But let's not forget, there's a bit of the art in the neuroimage. Refining the art to maintain the validity and value of the technique is very important. But it's also very important how we steward this knowledge into the public domain so that it's not misappropriated, so that it can be used in such a way that is right and good. The problem with the multidisciplinary pain centers, as you just heard from the previous lecture, isn't that they didn't work. It's that they got bastardized is that all of a sudden, everybody was calling themselves a multidisciplinary pain center, and the insurance company said, stop. You've misused that term. You're not really doing that. We need this evidence. Not only evidence-based medicine, but medicine-based evidence. We have treatment and enhancement issues. How much pain should we take away? All of it? Maybe, but what if we do? What if we take away all pain? What happens then to our maximum of non-harm if I can take it all away? Is that something to strive for? Is that not realistic? And moreover, who should be the arbiter of how much pain goes away? The patient? Take it all away. Or the physician? One could take a look, for example, at cosmetic surgery. Make them bigger. Pull it tighter. Can the patient be trusted? Is it, in fact, as Roddice and Parolets have said, that this is indeed an extended peer group? Is that the nature of shareholder valuation, a real partnership? Perhaps. But there's a level of stewardship and responsibility to make sure those individuals have the right information to be able to articulate the good. Uncertainties of frontier science. This is new. What happens as we begin to flip over the dominoes? Are we prepared, not just precautionary, but are we prepared to deal with that? And these may be somewhat philosophical, conceptual issues, but then we really bring it home, put it into the social milieu, because that's where this happens. It doesn't occur in a social vacuum. What about the legal issues that are going on here? Can we utilize neuroimaging, if in fact we get the sophistication to such a point, to then bring it into the court and say, this individual doesn't have pain? Look at the neuroimage. He says, but I hurt. I'm not dead yet. I don't see any pain. You do not have a neuroimage that's representative of pain. But I hurt. I suffer. Oh, garbage. You're malingering. Look, there are those companies, although very contentious and provocative, that are now posturing that this form of technology can, in fact, be utilized for deception detection. And although that claim is widely seen as fallacious and fraudulent, the way these particular standards work, Fry and Daubert standards work, are their casuistic standards. The more the thing gets used in courts of law, and the more there are expert witnesses to be able to testify to the value and validity by virtue of its increasing valid appropriation in the literature, the more these things are then seen as being used validly in those ways. Speaks to the whole issue of what is really impact factor, what is a popularity contest, etc. You're the stewards of this. Informed consent. How informed should the patient be, particularly if that patient is part of a larger share group? that decides who gets what and how they get it. I think I, I, I advocate for that. We talked briefly about the idea of a large communitarian idea of pain medicine. And certainly organizations such as this are very strong in organizing just this type of thing, where you bring together the shareholders with the stakeholders, with the funders, and say, fund this. I think that's going to be the future, not only of pain medicine, but of much of neuroscience, if not medicine in general. But that then requires the obligation there is to inform those individuals about benefits, burdens, risks, and harms, so that, in fact, valuable equipoise is not just a clinical tool, 
but is also then communicated back to the patient so you can really get what Fulford has referred to as values-based medicine and what Waters and Subpoena refer to as goal-directed health care, which I strongly advocate in pain medicine. You then get to these antimonies of diagnosis, a fancy philosophical word, which basically means you can't have A and B. I can't say, well, yes, you've got this pain syndrome, and go, great, I've got this diagnosis. You have this wonderful diagnosis. Then because I've got this diagnosis, I won't assure you. Diagnosis not only names, it claims, and it frames. We have to be very, very careful that the things that we're looking to concretize aren't also a source of blame. Because then that gets us to the next ethical issue, which is how do we then distribute these goods? The tension between commutative and distributive justice is critical. All of the technologies you hear, I would argue strongly, have a valid and valuable place in the armamentarium of pain assessment and pain care. Who gets the goodies? How do we say that we're going to, in fact, distribute these based upon unequal need? Why does our healthcare system work that way now? Those who can afford it? Will we perhaps generate a neurotechnologically enabled elite who say, I can pay for them and you can't? How do we prevent the neurotechnological pendulum from swinging and widening the gap between the haves and have nots, particularly in these areas of those who need it? And if, in fact, one of the things we're saying is, I can objectify pain in you, but you can't afford it. And so we got to be careful here, too, because there's a social stigma. You know what happens with those we do who can't and are the have nots. And then it's a question of culture. We're talking here about things on a worldwide stage. You heard that earlier, being able to reach out beyond, spreading out to India, spreading out to the African subcontinent, the use of telemedicine, bravo that. But what about biopower? What about, yeah, we may be able to reach out, but can they sustain? Can that be funded? Who's gonna pay for that? How do we then embrace those cultural norms? How do we encounter those cultural norms? We have colleagues here from Korea who said this is the first time they're in this area, and this is great, and they want to engage with us. It's not just a question of the West versus the rest anymore. There are different ethical standards, norms, and philosophical orientations that need to be encountered in the way medicine is conducted, and these are critical. You've already heard the use of integrative medicine, oriental medicine, Chinese medicine, Indian medicine, and Ayurveda. How do these neurotechnologies leverage and gain purchase with those particular philosophical and conceptual and very practical approaches to health care? Not just medicine, health care. Don't do this. La, la, la. People say, well, uh, the scientists just deal with the science. Let the ethicists and philosophers and poly... No, wrong. Deborah's talk probably showed you all too well what happens when the rhetoric is, well, what we need is advocacy. Really, what does that mean? Who's going to do this? This crazy takes discourse. Heads should not be tucked in the sand or into any other orifice in which it fits. Nor should we do this. Let's just march ahead and we'll fly. <sighs> Come on will fall. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't run to the edge of the cliff. It simply means we've got to be prepared. I'm a New York guy. I'm not going to come here, fetch about the dark, and not leave you by lighting a candle. I used to drive a taxi cab when I was in grad school. So I'm going to tell you the whole story before we get to your corner and then let you out and go have a good day. This is what we've got to do. You want to use this stuff? You want to use all the high-tech stuff? I'm all for it. I make a living on this stuff. But use it in ways that are not just technically right. Strive to use it in ways that are ethical, legally, and socially sound. How? What are the risks, known and perhaps unknown? Are the unique ethical and social issues? What risk analyses and ethical systems might we use? What things may be totally useless? Throw them away. How do novel situations militate what types of risk analyses we're going to do? That's the whole idea of this level of advocacy to say, yeah, not only this is what we can do, but this is what we should do. We advocate at our noble little group, as humble as it may be, what we call a 6P process. Pragmatic analysis. What do we know? What do we not? What can the technology do? What can it not? Let's be real about this. No neurofiction, no neurolalia, no nonsense. Let's not be complete dystopians or let's not be complete utopians. We have to be prepared. Are things going to go wrong? Absolutely, they will. Will certain technologies be shown after they may be released into practice to be deleterious in some way and be burdensome? Absolutely they will. But are those risks in some way recuperable, recoverable, or forgivable? Do we have the stances, the policies, the tools on board to be able to navigate those shifting architectonics? 
Obviously, what's that going to take? It takes people. My argument is simple. It takes science and technology being in step with the humanities. What does that mean? It means people who are trained in the sciences shouldn't just hang out in the lab or the clinic. These are the individuals who have to be vox populus, the voice of the people. They have to be able to recognize, I work in the lab, I can influence policy and guidelines. I work with patients, I have a voice. It's a very bottom-up and top-down orientation. And be pessimistic. Skepsis, it's a chastity belt of science, folks. I rally against neurolalia and neuro nonsense in all of its forms, here too. There's a lot of things this technology can do and it's wonderful. There's a lot of stuff it can't. Let's not confuse those. We have a responsibility. We have to say it can't do this, but it can do this. Let's really optimize what it can do. And ultimately, this then leads to prudence in our decisions and actions. I was trained by Edmund Pellegrino. You heard that name earlier. Uh, I spent the first couple of years that I was at Georgetown working directly with Ed, and he's a strict Aristotelian who really appealed to my philosophical background. He was also trained by Jesuits. And what he used to say is, Jim, what you freely assert, I can deny. Defend your case. Be prudent. Ladies and gentlemen, what you freely assert, some insurance company or some provider or perhaps some colleague is going to freely deny. Defend your case. Be prudent. Prudent is practical wisdom. Does it work? In whom? Why? It's an approach to personalized medicine that enjoins those factors that may, in fact, not work and conjoins those that do in a biopsychosocial approach. Is it going to work by itself without the bucks to support the research and to support the translation? Uh-uh. It needs that money. How does that money get to where it's got to go? Policy. How does policy get informed? Look around the room. There's no magic. This is not leger de main. This is, this is procedural. Groups like this need to disseminate and publish, as I know Peter and Mark will do. Each one of you have the opportunity to go back and say, this is what I've learned. This is why it's important. This is what we must do. That level of bottom-up advocacy, critical. Because this is the problem we have. No one can come along and go try to stop the pendulum, break their neck and try to stop the pendulum of progress. No one should. Number one, you can't. Number two, you shouldn't, because along with this technological advancement, we see the positive dimensions of technology, and that's what we focus on. Look, let's face it. Every advancement in technology, and I would even argue in national defense, by the way, is advocated because of its potential benefits. No one says, I'm going to build something that's really going to suck. Oh, this is going to be terrible. You don't do that. And you could argue, well, what about military weaponry? It's to defend a lifestyle and protect us against the bad guys. Certainly, these uses of neurotechnology in the area of medicine and pain medicine are very strongly being advocated because of the potential benefits and possibilities they hold. But very often, our preparedness for burdens and risks, and I mean multidimensional burdens and risks, not only those that are practical, that arise from those ambiguities that will, in fact, emerge as the science is indeed engaged by an ever larger population of users. You're going to get burdens and risks, folks. Be prepared for them but also the ethical, legal, social, and economic burdens and risks. What I call for is simply this, a little bit more alignment. The idea of keeping things in step. So as we then move towards an unforeseen future, isn't that, that is fancy, we can at least keep in pace. The, no, I don't believe in CD, I throw up. So what ends up happening is we really want to try to maintain, I'll do it again, we'll really try to maintain this balance. It is an alignment of the sciences with the humanities. Why? Look, you hear so much about STEM these days, science, technology, engineering, and medicine. It's where I hang my hat. It's very important. But when it comes to medicine, that area of STEM, of technology, engineering, mathematics, in medicine, absent the humanitarian dimension, creates a legion of technocrats. Who will then argue the case? for how to utilize these things in ways that maximize the good of only 10,000 people versus 100,000. That the financial burden of developing this is actually going to be worth it because of a 99% improvement rate of a small n. Who's going to do that unless there is the in-step pacing of the integration of the sciences, technology, ethics, and policy? In-step. A more aligned pendulum of progress. And I argue it's that alignment that's critical. It's an alignment of neuroscience, neurotechnology, as you'll hear today, neuroethics, pain medicine, laws and policies. Can't be anachronistic. Anachronistic stumbles and defaults into dogma like that. 
It mandates a desiloing, as you saw, not only with regard to the convergence of the sciences, but the convergence of the sciences, the humanities, the social sciences, more broadly. I give you this. You know what that is, right? Thanks. It's an egg. It's not a trick question. You want to see what the system really looks like? It's that. Ooh, it scrambled my guidelines and policy. This is not a foreign word. This is not gu, i, dele. That's guidelines. That's policy. Think of the egg. What do you got on the outside? You got a shell. What do you got on the inside? What do you got on the inside? Yolk. What part gets fertilized? You should know this. <laughs> oh, boy. And they were going to call me oops. <laughs> The inside gets fertilized. What part grows? What part can become the bird and fly? The inside. This is the way science, technology, ethics, and policy work. Very simply, this is what I give you. The outside, the hard shell, very important. Why? Because without the hard shell, the growing part, the changing part, the part that will develop and become the phoenix bird, is nothing more than snot. It's just empty. There's no support. But if I get rid of the living part, the part that embraces current epistemological capital, the acknowledged realities that science tells us, the ends and practices of, of science and medicine taken together that then give us the integral premises and moral values that determine the rightness and goodness of the way we use neuroscience or any science, the constructs of healthcare and medicine, the foundational duties that go along to pain medicine. You heard them. Number one, believe the patient. Number two, pain is real. Number three, the affirmation of doing things in the patient's best interest. These are what we sometimes call deontologic structures of, of pain medicine. The duties, the obligations, buy the ticket, take the ride. Don't believe those? Be a plumber. Obviously, though, people enact this stuff. So there's an agentic level of this. How you enact this in process, within your particular practice, well, that's important. So what we see is a, an ethic of duty with regard to the profession but certainly a very strong ethic of agency and responsibility when we come down to the individual agency of practice, of doing. And this then what is upholding, the serving the good of individuals and society through the use of advancing science, not esoterically, but for good. Embracing the heuristic of science and technology to be mutually reciprocal. But you know, all of this, it's not on the ground without the framework around it that embraces policy and guidelines to develop and insulate how this will work, how this will grow, how this will be supported. Without the good stuff in the middle, that shell, brittle, fragile. You know this all too well. You heard this conversation this morning. Meaningless guidelines and policies that have no relation or serve the development of the meaningful practice of pain medicine. You push on that, what does it do? It shatters under the weight of responsibility. It's that reciprocity, it's that interaction, it's that alignment that's critical. It allows this not only to grow, but to develop. My argument to you folks is that's why a neuroethics of pain care is so important, because it embraces the research and translational enterprise and nests it firmly in the legal and social fabric in which both science and medicine are conducted, in which the pain patient finds themselves embedded. With increasing knowledge comes increasing power. With increasing power comes great responsibility. My argument to you is simple. Why are conferences like this not only important but necessary? Because responsibility must be grounded in reality and its contingencies. What can we do? What can we not? And how we navigate the difference in between. This is the ongoing work of the field. It's the ongoing work of neuroethics as a very important part, an arguable part, of pain medicine. Reflection, insight, moral consideration must accompany, proceed, and then must go along with every conceivable act of inquiry, invention, and intervention. My father was an engineer. When I was a little kid, he used to bounce me on his knee, and he used to say to me, Jim, measure twice, cut once. Bless his heart. Dad was right. I think that becomes the mantra for the way we use neuroscience and any science and neurotechnology or any technology in pain medicine. Measure twice, cut once. The pendulum of progress swings fast, folks. Very often there is no turning back. I thank you for your time. Thank you. So uh, any questions, we can open this up for discussion. Uh, Judith? Hi, when you put up your 6P, it helped me how my language might mix with your language. Your 6P, I immediately thought of, and your desire to mix science with humanities, 
uh, that uh, could we also call your 6P collective wisdom? Oh, yeah, without a doubt. I mean, th- this piece is very important. Prudence is practical wisdom. Yes. So the actual definition of prudence that I use is the, the Aristotelian term, which is called phronesis. A wonderful discourse on phronesis comes out of book six of the Nicomachean Ethics. I mean, if, if you're into the philosophy thing, you have nothing better to do but put yourself to sleep. My, it, what it really suggests is that not only is it practical wisdom, but that practicality comes from a communality. That collective, it, yeah. It's, that's it's collective. That's what we're doing here today. I mean, without, I, without I, doubt. I see that. Without doubt. Thank you. Yes, sir. This is more a comment about, um, about what you just said. Um, I agree with you that technology, we have to use technology carefully. Mm-hmm. And um, there's an example out there right now, are the MRIs. Mm-hmm. And invariably, patients have walked into offices all over um, and said, oh, look, I have a disc herniation, and that's the reason why I have this pain. And it has nothing to do with MRI at all, nothing. Uh, billions of dollars are spent on imaging for this kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, having said that, I think there's a middle ground we should use is uh, use tech- it's, it's, you know, I teach my medical students and I tell them, look, 80% of your diagnosis is going to come from history and physical examination. Your hands are your best tools. Okay, the rest, 20% is where you use technology to add to it, to confirm or not to confirm your diagnosis. Mm-hmm. And I think in, in view of what you just said, I agree with you, is we have to be careful in how we use technology and not let it run away. You're right. I mean, we look. Have to, we have to not forget that your hands and your brains are your best tools. You know, I, you, technology is just there to help you. you help you're you're you absolutely get right. To a point. You know, we, we did a study, actually, a, a, a transatlantic study with Nisha Dogra at the University of Leicester and Nick France. And one of the things we looked at is actually medical students' attitudes, both in the U.S. and in the U.K., and now we're repeating the same study in Germany, with regard to technology. And they said, well, a technological test gives me certainty. But what if the actual technology itself is not predicated upon certainty, but is based upon a Gaussian distribution of signal and noise? Do you not understand that? Duh. So you're absolutely right. Understanding that technology is a tool, and like any other tool, it has a place. Now, how you use it depends on also the task at hand. So, for example, peering into a rather cryptic structure, for example, like the central nervous system of the brain, may be somewhat more indicative of the type of inductive reasoning you may need. I want to say, well, I can look into this, and based upon A, B, and C, I can induce that it may be that. It may also be, as you say, what I then want to do is deduce that based upon what I've then found, I utilize the imaging to then deduce backwards and say, yes, this is confirmatory for a diagnosis. So there's a number of different ways to use this. Some are inductive, some are deductive. There is no particular paradigm that would suggest it's utilized this way all the time. Again, what it really, really gets at is the point that you've well illustrated, is that what we are teaching your medical students, that I think is very important to teach the medical students, is that like any tool, Number one, there's a dependency on the way the craftsman utilizes the tool. There's certain nuances that are important there. But also the tool brings particular capabilities and limitations. The act of medicine combines both skill and some level of art to be able to intuit where to compensate for each and the above. And that's really why we call medicine techne in praxis. So you're absolutely right. As the technology improves, perhaps it's sort of aforementioned use. The idea of it being somewhat more inductive will become ever more sophisticated. But right now, it's important to appreciate the limitations and to compensate for those limitations by the tasks at hand. Do you have one more or no? Just sort of smallest. Uh, sure. Just a small aside, you've described yourself uh, having Aristotelian roots, and you probably also know that he excluded medicine from the canon of what needed to be taught at university. He did. Yeah, I mean, he absolutely did. He said, you know, medicine needs to be taught in the field. (laughs) That it was not simply to be confined within the ivory tower of the academy. That medicine was, in fact, an interpersonal act. And the interpersonality of medicine was such that certainly it was a profession, but it was a profession unlike others. And as a consequence, that level of practicality could only be achieved mano a mano, hand to hand. Interesting. One of the real problems in the field of not having evidence. So a lot of things are done in pain medicine, Mm -hmm. for example, and there's absolutely no evidence to suggest that they are uh, are working. Well, and so and so the the problem with this dictum is that um, 
you know, you can let something run, run wild, and then the obvious antibiotic will be there that treats everyone. Right. And then you don't have to argue one way or another, I, I think. No, no, you're right. I mean, look, there's, there's a couple of things to rally against. Number one is that you say there are, there are a number of things that are done simply by rote. Much of the technology that is used in pain medicine is used by rote. There isn't necessarily, over time, a large database but that would suggest that X, Y, or Z is actually efficient and effective in dealing with A, B, and C. We thought it was there. It seemed to be useful. It may be useful in a small number of cases. But once that then is then extracted from the very, very small end of those original studies, what we really find is with protracted use, the thing either doesn't work because it fails, or there's, once you get out into a larger phenotypic population, it's really just not that applicable. Stop. Stop. <laughs> you stop using it. That's the problem. I think if you look at the um, placebo controlled trials mm -hmm. in the UK, outside of pharmaceutical related studies, there are a handful, a handful of uh, studies, and one of them is in the viral behavioral domain, mm -hmm. where you know, really stringent, well controlled placebo studies are done. And so, and so here lies the problem. You could argue. That well, it worked for the population in terms of what it didn't say. Mm -hmm. But if, uh, you know, if I go to the good young doctor here and he gives me Charles River water or whatever, and it works. Well, you know, I mean, and, this, and that's an important situation too, because there, there are two points that came up in your discussion, I think both really warrant. A, a further, a further, a more detailed discourse. But we don't have time. But I'm happy to talk to you about it. Number one is the whole idea of the fallacy of placebo control and what that really means. I mean, that that then get back into a mechanistic orientation to some of the other work that's looking at mechanisms of at least patient-centered effects, whether we call it placebo or not. In the strictest sense, the idea of endogenous analgesic mechanisms that may be then induced by psychological, environmental variables. Very, very strong. We know that the clinical encounter is laden with that, and there's some of that as well. And we get a better, I think, neuroscience has provided a little bit more purchase on what some of that may be going on. The other issue is that, you know, sometimes an N of one in the clinical encounter is what works. If I say, well, this didn't work for all these guys over here, but it works for you, and then the responsibility of the good doctor over here is to say, well, the primacy of my benefit is to the patient, either their goals, their values, or their outcomes. Well, then realistically, it may not work for these people, but it does work for you. So once again, I mean, intuiting that prudently in practice, practical wisdom, is really going to be critical in this. And I think part of the, the problem that we're, we're getting with is that you heard earlier that pain medicine has not been well inculcated within a medical curriculum to be able to say there are nuances here that are very important to intuit that bring in a bit of the psychiatric and certainly the neurological and the socio-behavioral. And as a consequence, the, the very strict paradigmatic view of looking at cause and effect in pain care sometimes creates individuals who fall through the cracks and certainly real dilemmas in the clinical encounter. It's problematic. I think, sir. My name is Dr. Koshkin. I work here in Albuquerque. My accent is not from New Mexico. You're from New York, right? And no, New York. Sometimes I tell patients that I'm from Texas, and that's if they say, no, we don't believe it. Great. I just know you don't have enough worse. Here's two more milligrams, and then they say, okay, it's a whole other country out there. So when you was... In a corner, you're pointing to Erin and uh, doctor next to her saying, have and have not. I just want to point out, I work, I'm an anesthesiologist. I put mm -hmm. implants, pumps, stimulators into patients. I have a few with CRPS who have them. That system of have and have nots and widening gap between you know 1% of the country, Wall Street, and the rest of us, it's already here. Oh, without a doubt. I see patients every day, and they, if they have UNM care insurance, which means whether I spend with them an hour or an hour and a half, my department will only get $15, no matter what I do and how much time I spend, versus, and I will tell them, you have CRPS, I'll be happy to give you lumbar sympathetic block. It's free care and it's allowed, but if that doesn't work, or if you get pain relief for a week, which means it's not practical, you can't be doing it every week uh, for the rest of your life, I'll tell them, your insurance does not allow me to even try you as a stimulator. Which, again, it's not a panacea, but yet another tool, completely different mechanism. Maybe helpful. You have no options for that. Just wait. Mm -hmm. If you're not going to die in five years, you're going to get your Medicare, and then it's not a problem. You're going to have it. So the system of have and have not, it's already here. Mm -hmm. And your picture is a big bird with head buried in the sand. In the sand, that's where we are right now. We're just mm -hmm. ignoring it completely. No, you're right. I mean, I, I didn't mean to imply that, oh, that may happen. That has happened. And the risk we run is widening that schism between the haves and the have-not 
by the way we appropriate the use of these various forms of science and technology, and that's very, very critical to understand. Um, this is not to toot my horn. Three years ago, Michael Chapman and Rolly Benedictor and I did a survey paper that some of you may have read. It appeared, I think it was in, in the journal Pain Physician. And what we really wanted to look at was the nature of stakeholder values and how that could then be leveraged with regard to pain care on the world stage. So we looked internationally at figures that were available to us in terms of patients in various forms of pain, treated and not. And you know, you could take a look at some very profoundly non-developed countries and those that are developing. You say, well, you expect to see those issues there. And then you turn the lens around and you make it a mirror. You look at the United States and you recognize that this whole issue of the health care plan, it's not a health care plan at all. It's actually a health care provisions plan. And of course, the issue there is supposed to be to narrow that schism and gap between the haves and have nots. And I'm very, very dubious of that because its articulation in practice is very, very difficult to really enact. And so you're absolutely right. Failing to recognize that we already have what may be for many people an insurmountable gap between those that can and those that can't, those that have and those that not. Unless that's fixed, the appropriation of these particular technologies then just loosed into that system of distributive justice is going to do absolutely nothing other than really widen that forge. And that's very dangerous. Good point. I think it's oh, I'm sorry. Somewhat, somewhat telling that the push for evidence-based medicine has not necessarily come from the practitioners. It's come from the payers uh -huh. and from the government as a payer. And, you know, we don't see as much of that demand from the practitioners because very often the claim is we know what works, mm -hmm. which may not be proven in, in any other case. So, you know, it's not a evidence base in order to take better care of the patient. Uh, unfortunately, the conversation has been mostly evidence based in order to determine how to apportion resources. That's right. And, and ultimately, what that does is that puts then the clinician into a gatekeeping mode. You're, you know, you're right. What I have found through sort of just empirical interaction, is that most clinicians practice what I would call medicine-based evidence. They're saying, this is my medicine. It provides me with a set of evidence. I know it works in my hand with this particular patient at this time and what doesn't. Very rarely do you say, well, let me delve into the literature and engage with some casuistry. If the case is rare, yeah, fine. If the case is not. Uh, Mark Boswell and I did a bit which was called evidence-based or evidence bias. Once again, it appeared in the journal Pain Physician. And that's... It reports just that. How you use evidence as a clinician sometimes is exceedingly intuitive and may not be uniform. He may use evidence very different than she may use or you may use, and that's wholly appropriate to the scenario at hand. However, what then comes down is you may decide that this patient needs X, but based upon some externalized evidence-based medicine paradigm, that patient cannot get X, which then drives you to some level of literature to say, if not X, then what? what works just as well, and that's a problem. Do you think at heart of the problem uh, related to evidence is that we have uh, sort of collectively decided to take frequentist statistics as the best measure of something having yes. evidential quality rather than reasoning, because we think reasoning can can be done by anyone and uh, yes. sort of an uncontrolled thing. As a philosopher, do you have an approach that gives metrics to the outlier? Oh, yeah. Because I mean, that's in a way what we are dealing with. Uh, and you know, I got, I mean, uh, it, by, by confession, I'm a hybrid. I mean, I, I, was, I was trained as a neuroscientist, early background philosophy, and then I'm a born again philosopher, right? And so, I think that it's not just a philosophical approach. I think it's a philosophical approach that's strongly conjoined to the way one does good science. It's not just based upon a frequency statistic. It's also based upon a variety of other factors that allow us to then look at degrees of freedom around a particular mean that we then establish as a viable threshold for this scenario. We establish the, the tightness of fit of the Gaussian kernel, correct? In doing that, we can also determine its skewness, its curtosity, because we recognize that population and what statistics are going to be viable for that. How we then go about this, putting that, that philosophical, scientifically philosophical approach into practice, into clinical practice, I don't know if it's going to be a sea change or just a good soaking, but I think that one of the things that has to happen is it has to be a reorientation back to the call to the clinician to be able to determine what level of evidentiary basis is going to be meaningful in clinical practice rather than that being an external statistic that is then applied to clinical practice. You have two, very, you have two competing ends, and I think that 
the misalignment of those ends has created great problems also in the lexicon we use. Evidence, not evidence, what's medically based, what's outcome. A uniformity of that lexicon that is far more appreciative of what the clinician is trying to do and what the patient needs, I think is definitely in being called for. Your point is spot on. Great. So with that. Thank you. Thank you.